Hello everyone. My name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. Today is episode 17 of Azure Zero to Hero series and in this video we will learn how to deploy a e-commerce application onto the AKS cluster. So this e-commerce application is made of eight services, eight microservices. There are two databases that are involved. One is MySQL database and one is MongoDB. Along with that, there is also a Redis, which is in-memory data store. So this project is combination of deployments, stateful sets, persistent volumes, storage classes. Along with that, we will also implement ingress configuration. Once I deploy this entire project on Kubernetes, I'll show you how to create the ingress controller and also ingress to expose this application to the external world. So it's going to be a lot of learning. Please try to watch this video till the end. So before we learn how to deploy this on a Kubernetes cluster, the first thing that we need to do is understand the architecture of an application. In this case, this happens to be a e-commerce application. So let's understand typically how does e-commerce applications architecture look like. So firstly, I deployed this application on my laptop. Right now it's not running on Kubernetes, but to help you understand the architecture and also the high level design, I have initially deployed this on my local. If you are wondering how did I do it, it's very simple. You can go to my GitHub organization followed by three tire architecture demo repo. I'll also put the link in the description. This application is something that I did not write. I took it from the Instana robot shop, which is written by IBM people. So this is actually a IBM project, I have just forked it. Of course, I could have even uh, performed the demo from their uh, GitHub repository, but I had made some changes according to EKS and AKS. We have also demonstrated this project on Amazon. So if you are interested in learning on the EKS platform, then you can follow this folder. There are detailed steps that are involved, right? What are the uh, prerequisites, how to set up the cluster and everything. And there is also a video on the channel. But today's video is focused on AKS. So because I've tweaked something, uh, that's the reason why I'm using my fork. Right? But the complete uh, source code credits goes to the Instana project. Okay. Now, if you want to run it local, you can uh, just clone this repository and run Docker Compose up, which is something that I have done. Now let's try to understand the project. So there is a user interface, typically how your Amazon or Flipkart, all of them have a good user interface. Similarly, this project also has a user interface. And what is this project actually doing? So it's a proof of concept project for learning e-commerce. If someone wants to understand how DevOps engineers or how to write a e-commerce application, you can use this project. And this is actually selling some robots. Just like Amazon sells merchandise, boots, electric products, electronic products. This particular uh, project is actually selling the robots. So there are a bunch of robots and you know, anyone can log into this particular project and buy the robots, which is a pseudo behavior. So firstly, user, if we understand the user workflow, so user would actually register a account, which I have just done. I've created a uh, email address, dummy one and a dummy username. And once you register, you can actually log in just like I'm, I've logged in at this point. And then there are categories. So there are two categories. If you go to Amazon or Flipkart, there are some thousands of categories, but because this is a proof of concept or demo uh, project, there are only two categories. One is artificial intelligence. One is robots. Actually, e-commerce applications might have multiple categories like uh, if you take Amazon, they might have men's, women's, they might have some accessories, they might have some um, you know, clothing related one. So there are different categories. Here there is one category called artificial intelligence and one category called robot. So you can pick up any of these uh, robots that are available, right? So let me pick up responsive enforcer droid. So this is the responsive enforcer droid. And here, what you can do is 
one, you can provide the ratings for it. If you have already purchased and if you know if this product is good or bad, you can provide ratings just like I provided five rating now. And I can check out the product. Let's say I want five pieces of it. So I can select the quantity as five and add to cart. Not just this, but you can also use the search option to browse through the uh, entire uh, products. Let's say I search for stain, stan. There is something called stan, right? So let me search for stan. And I get this uh, search option here and I can also click the robot. And let me say I want 10 uh, quantity of this, quantities of this. So I've added both of them to the cart, just like how you do for a typical e-commerce application. Then you can click on the cart option and here you can check out. And once you check out, depending upon the region that you're providing, so this application also does that. Let's say if I select India and let's say I select Hyderabad, it calculates how far it is uh, from the, this application uh, assumes to be, uh, let's say in the US region. So how far is India and Hyderabad from that? And what is the cost of shipping? Let's say I select uh, Canada and uh, I select Montreal, right? Or let me pick up this, any of the region that is available here. I randomly picked up one. So here the cost is different. And if you click on the confirm button, so here you have all the applications that you have selected, sorry, all the bots that you have selected, including the shipping cost. Click on the pay enough button. You can also integrate the payment gateway in this application. You can uh, integrate it with your PayPal or you can integrate it with your Stripe. But I did not do that particular thing. I just went with the default flow. And it says review our product. Thanks for ordering continue shopping. So exactly how a e-commerce application would work, but a very minimalistic e-commerce application. If you are a developer, let's say you want to understand how e-commerce applications are written. One more advantage is that all the source code is also available. So everything is open sourced. You can also go through the source code of it and learn how to write a e-commerce application. And one more good thing about this project, I'll stop talking about the project in a couple of minutes and I'll go to the high level design. But just to finish, also one good thing about this thing project is that each microservice is, is written in a different programming language. Just that you get the feel of working on all the programming languages. As a DevOps engineer, uh, let's say the payments application. So here the payment application is actually written in Python. So you will learn how to write a Docker file for the Python application. If you look at uh, the catalog, let's say. Catalog is written in Node.js. So you can learn how to containerize a Node.js application. You can look at, uh, let's say, cart. Cart is written again in uh, JS. So you can learn how to containerize a Node.js application. Let's move to a different one. Uh, if I pick up, let's say, the ratings application. So here, ratings is uh, written in a different programming language. Let's see what is this one. So it is written in PHP. So you can also containerize a PHP application. So you will get feel of all the programming languages and containerizing applications in different programming languages by following the source code as well. Developers, they can understand how to write the application. So now that we have experienced the complete product, we have registered as a user and we perform the end-to-end -end workflow. So let me try to explain what are the list of microservices that this project is using to make up this entire stance robot shop, right? Of course, I looked into the source code before, so I know it better, but let me try to explain you without showing the code, right? If I just walk you through the GitHub repository, it will be a little difficult. So I will try to explain and then I'll walk you through the GitHub repository. So the first microservice is the user microservice and this microservice takes care of the registration, right? So as soon as we access this website, the first thing that we have done is we have registered a user. Then there can be some validations such as 
is the user registering with a valid email address or not there can be some restrictions with the password everything is taken care by the register and once we register then this information is stored and we can log into the website because we have already registered our username and password is recorded and if you provide the perfect username and password you can log into this particular stance robot shop so there is a user microservice and this user microservice will also access a database so there should be a database and this database should have the information related to the users username password all of these things then second one as soon as i register the immediate thing that i've done is i have explored the catalog so obviously the another microservice should be the catalog microservice and within the catalog microservice there are different categories there are different products each product has a description to it there is a pricing there is a image right so there are so many things that are involved with the catalog microservice then there is the cart microservice right and what exactly is this cart microservice doing so if i like any of these robots i can select the robot and i can add it to the cart and even if i log out log in back then the information has to be preserved in the cart so cart of course if i check out and if i buy the product then that will not be in the cart it will be uh, in the uh, purchased items which this uh, stance robot shop does not maintain only if you did not uh, move to the payments then the application will be still preserved in the cart so that is about the cart microservice after that there should be something related to the payments because if you go to the cart then you have an option to proceed with the payments of course before the payment if you have noticed when i was uh, showing you the end to end workflow there is a shipping calculation that is going on right so there should be a shipping microservice and what is this shipping actually doing depending upon your location it is calculating the distance and it is providing the amount of price in some cases this is hard coded so you can also ignore but in real e-commerce websites what is this uh, stands robot shop trying to show us is how does a e-commerce website function so depending upon the location that you are so it has stored all the information different countries locations and depending upon the location this shipping microservice is actually calculating how much uh, should it charge for the shipping to a particular location or even if uh, the product is available in that location or not this is about shipping now once shipping is done right uh, okay you selected the location then you clicked on the payment let's say the payment is also done then there is dispatch so dispatch microservice is providing us the information that okay your product is selected and the payment is also authorized authenticated we got the payment then it is showing us a display message right that okay so your product is ready to deliver and uh, we have dispatched your product there is one more microservice that we did not talk about is web now how are we accessing this entire application we are accessing because there should be uh, the user interface the html uh, for this and probably written in angular or written in react or written in html whatever it is but end of the day this should be deployed into a web server and there should be a microservice which is hosting the web server right it can be nginx or it can be httpd so this is another microservice so these are the ones now let's go back and look at the code and try to understand if we listed out the things correct or not it's very simple if you go back to the uh, source code then you will see the folders each folder is representing a microservice so ignore aks ignore this one ignore eks k8s openshift docker swam applications the services starts from here cart we got it right catalog we got it right dispatch we got it right 
again ignore both of these things this is for the load testing then there is a mongo db there is a mysql db i'll come to the db parts there is payments which we got right ratings shipping user web perfect so we got all the microservices right of course i explored this project before don't uh, don't think that okay abhishek has got everything right uh, on the first time i worked this project uh, i worked on this project before when i was trying to deploy this on the eks cluster on amazon so that's why i know this project better probably first time you might get some things wrong and by looking at the source code or with understanding about the e-commerce applications you can get all of these things right but there is no rocket science or you know i'm not like uh, someone who can get everything right nobody can get that right for the first time so don't worry about that now we got the microservices right but abhishek why are there databases here like we can see that there is a mongodb and there is a mysql database very simple so if you go back right if you go to this website there are images when you click on a robot for example this is a image and if you click on a particular robot again there are some images right so where are all of these images stored so there should be a database right so for that reason this project is using mysql database uh, yeah so this project is using mysql database for storing all the images related to the uh, products and then there has to be a database for the user registration and all that's where this project is using mongodb simple question that can be asked here abhishek cannot i use only one single database and maintain different tables of course you can do it like you know uh, you can do anything but what this project aims is to provide information about different uh, databases like anyone who explores this project they should have a very good hands on using different programming languages different databases that's how this demo project is designed to give you better understanding that's why there is one mysql database and there is a mongodb maybe in real times also this is a very valid use case because uh, for all the unstructured information such as the images all the uh, unstructured data you can use uh, a different database and for the user registrations and uh, all the other secure information you can maintain a different database that is also fine right and intentionally each of this service is written in different programming language like for example if you go to cart right so if i go to cart so cart is written by looking at these things it should be written in node js right yeah it is written in node js and if i go to let's say payments so payments is actually written in python right uh, looking at the requirements.txt i understood or the py extension i understood and docker file also explains that this is written in python similarly one microservice is written in php one is written in java the reason for that is in real times probably all of these microservices can be written in one programming language itself the team or the entire project can sit down and decide upon a programming language but to give you a better understanding about different programming languages and if someone uses this project as a devops engineer they can get hands on on writing docker files for different projects that's where you know each microservice is written in different programming language but it's not a uh, mandatory thing it is not that each microservice has to be written in different programming language the only criteria for having a different microservice is that each of these components should be independently managed deployed right so the let's say if i want to deploy the payments application it should not disturb anything with respect to the cart so if the payment application can be independently deployed independently managed removed and replaced in such cases we will use a different microservice so instead of writing the entire project in one single monolith application if you write them as different projects one is it will be very easy to understand the code it will be very easy to deploy and in future if you want to debug or troubleshoot a particular issue it will be very easy if there is issue with shipping i can just go to the shipping source code understand what is the issue remove this version deploy a new version 
with the fix. That's why microservice architecture applications are better than monolith. So here cart is written in Node.js, right? As we saw, uh, payments was written in Python, I believe. And maybe dispatch was written in PHP. This is for the same reasons. So, okay, Abhishek, I understood about the microservices. Then I understood about the databases, but there is also, right? If you, if you carefully observe here, if I go back, And if you look at the project very carefully, there is one service that I missed. Actually, I kept it at the end because this service is quite different from the other services. So the stance robot shop handles rating microservice in a slightly different way. That's why I thought I'll talk about it at the end. So this is our eighth microservice. And what exactly is this rating service? If you go to Stan's robot shop and click on any of the robots, you get the rating corresponding to that robot, right? So hundreds of people might have rated that robots. It's a public application, the Stan's robot shop, let's say. And uh, there is one robot that is purchased by hundreds of people and they have provided a rating to it. So when you log into that Stan's robot shop, you should be seeing the rating of that particular product that you have selected. Along with that, you should be also able to rate the product. So if there are 10 robots or if there are 100 robots and each robot has a different rating, you need to store that rating somewhere. It can be a database or it can be a in-memory data store or a caching server such as Redis. There are a couple of reasons why this project has actually chosen a in-memory data store or probably why they have chosen a in-memory data store over a database. The first reason of choosing a in-memory data store over a database can be, you know, ratings is very dynamically computed. Let's say you access a product right now and you access it like 15 minutes later. You went to Amazon, you initially looked for a product, rating is 4.1 and 15 minutes later, uh, let's say you browsed different other products and you came back to that. Initially, when you search for the product, there can be some thousand people who have rated it and 15 minutes later, this number can be 1015 or this number can be uh, 1100 as well. It's a, if it's a very popular product. So, the rating keeps changing very dynamically. And initially when you opened the product, thousand people have uh, actually rated it. And in the next 15 minutes, there are hundred more people who have rated it. So the computation or the calculation has to be performed very dynamically. In such cases, it is better to go with in-memory data stores or caching servers because they are very fast in retrieving the information. If you put that information in a database and try to get that information very often from a database, there can be some latency that is involved. Instead, if you store it in your in-memory data store or caching server and quickly try to get it, then the calculation can be little faster. Right? So that can be one of the reasons why this product might have gone with Redis over database. Or second thing is like I told you right from the beginning of the video, this is a microservice demo project. And the main goal of this is to demo their uh, Instana product. And also for people, whoever is accessing this microservice product, they can get better feel over different uh, components such as microservices, uh, databases. And if they make one of the service using a in-memory data store, then they will add one more thing to their product. So the product becomes very uh, wide use case product. That can be another reason why they have gone for in-memory data store for one of the services. So user service is connected to a DB. Then you have the uh, catalog, which is connected to a DB. And 
this db is different mongodb this db is mysql db here instead of using a database probably they thought let us use a in memory data store so that the project also gets to use different level of components any of the reason can be very valid both of the reasons are actually very valid so it depends and this particular in memory data store usually when you deal with redis most of the times redis is created as a stateful set and it is connected to a persistent volume why because in this case if you take the same example for some reason if redis goes down in kubernetes pods can go down for hundreds of reasons they are very ephemeral in nature in this case if you are redis pod goes down then technically rating of all the products can become not applicable or not available so all the effort that you have put in to store the ratings of all the products or all the robots is gone if your redis is gone of course in kubernetes when a pod goes down a new pod is created by the replica set but the new pod will not have the information because this is stored in memory right so that's why what we usually do is we connect that to a persistent volume and set up redis as a stateful set with that the memory or the information is actually stored in a persistent volume instead of in memory and when the new redis pod comes up right when a new redis pod comes up it will actually talk to the persistent volume and it will get all the previously stored information that's why the product is or the ratings is designed in such a way that ratings let's say ratings is a python code or ratings is a, a go code it is connected with redis and redis is created as a stateful set and is connected to a persistent volume so this is how it is designed perfect now these are the different components we looked at all the components now if you look folder by folder we discussed about web we discussed about user shipping ratings payments mysql mongo ignore these two folders dispatch catalog catalog and cart we covered all of these things now what we need to do is we need to deploy this microservice architectured application onto a aks cluster and for that we will need docker files first to create these microservices into containers and from there we need to create the kubernetes manifest and then deploy to a aks cluster but because aks cluster will take some time to create let me create that first and while it is getting created i will try to explain how this microservices can be converted to a kubernetes deployment manifest in this case helm charts so firstly let's go to let's search for aks and uh, here let's create a aks cluster create a kubernetes cluster and uh, let us also create a resource group right uh, let me create this resource group as three tier or let me call it as e commerce demo e commerce demo okay and uh, now what i'm going to do is quickly select these options like i've explained in the previous classes cluster preset configuration keep it as dev test kubernetes cluster name let's call it as three tier region can be us uh, west us 2 in my case i am connected to a vpn uh, that's why i'll go with uh, west us 2 uh in your case you can pick up region that is near to you availability zones let me pick up zone 1 aks pricing tier free but this is not completely free it is only your cluster management that comes for free but end of the day your workloads when it is running the networking storage everything will be charged uh, we are not worried about other options here uh i can pick up the default node pool as well because i am immediately going to delete them and uh, yeah i think i'm good with other options let me click on review plus create and make sure your validation is passed if your validation is not passed better select a different region right rather than changing the options 
if you are only looking at the demo, pick up another region that is near to you and make sure the validation is passed. There can be reasons why validations can fail. One common reason is if you are using free subscription, there might be some resource quota issues. So in my case, I picked up West US 2 validation is good. Now the cluster is getting created. It will take some sweet 10 to 15 minutes. So let it go there. I will explain. Right. So right now we understood about microservices, right? So to deploy these microservices onto Kubernetes cluster, one is first we have to pick up these microservices. We need to containerize them. So to containerize, we need Docker files. And once we containerize, we need K8 manifest files. And then we need to convert them to Helm charts. And finally, we will deploy this Helm chart onto the AKS cluster. So we have set of things to do. Let's go step by step. Firstly, how to containerize these microservices, right? One good thing for you is all of these microservices are already containerized, right? Because this uh, stands robot RoboShop. It's demoed a lot of times. So they have all the Docker files in place. Let's go service by service and try to understand the Docker files. Most of the times uh, the Docker files will look in the similar way, just that you need to understand how to containerize a particular programming language. Uh, let's start with the cart application. So if you look at the cart application, so this is a Node.js application. And if you don't know the internals of that particular microservice, while writing the Docker file, it is better to sit with the developers. I'll give you best example. Probably you don't know what should be the entry point or what should be the CMD. How to start this microservice. If you don't know, you cannot get this information. You can sit with the development team and ask them, okay, just give me the steps to build this microservice. I will create the Docker file and how to run this. Tell me so that I will put it that in the CMD. This is a very plain uh, or simple Node.js application, the cart one. So we will start with the base image as a Node.js uh, base image or a Node image and ignore the Instana fields. Instana uh, is basically, like I told you, it's a monitoring tool uh, from IBM and they have set these parameters because they use this project, the Stans Robot Shop, to demo their uh, monitoring and the metrics uh, functionalities of their Stans Robot Shop. So that's why they said uh, this particular environment variable. Even if you remove this environment variable, it will not impact this project in any ways. Then expose the port on which this microservice or uh, this particular microservice which you are talking about, the cart is running. Switch to a working directory. Uh, what is working directory? Where you want to perform all the actions from the next step. If you go to your laptop, you have a preferred directory, right? Probably if you want to create a notepad or your rough information, you just go to the downloads folder or uh, in Linux, you have something like TMP folder, OPT folder, where you have the preferred directories where you want to store the downloads. You want to store your uh, scratch info, scrap information. So even in Docker files, it is preferred to pick up a working directory and run commands. The next steps on that particular working directory. Again, if you don't pick up working directory, it will go to the default directory. Copy the package.json. If you have uh, any prior experience with Node.js, if you don't have, just understand that package.json holds all the information of the dependencies. If you know Python, you can compare this with requirements.txt. If you know uh, Java, you can compare this with maven pom.xmls. Not true comparison, but you can just compare that. If you know Go, you can compare this with go.mod, just like that. Now, with my experience, I know that, okay, if it's a Node.js, there is a package.json file. If, the, if it is Python, there is requirements.txt. If it is Go, there is go.mod. If it is, um, let's say, Java, there is pom.xml, right? And if it is uh, Rust, there is cargo file. So this comes with your experience. 
copy package.json to the working directory that we have just created. And once you copy the dependencies, the next step would be to install the dependencies. That's where we are running npm install. So we have all the dependencies that we are installing inside this container or you, while building the container image. Finally, we are copying the server.js, which is the source code. The cart application entirely the source code is written in the so, uh, server.js. So the dependencies for server.js are installed using npm install. Now to just run the server.js, we are running this command called node server.js. To run any application, if it is a Python application, let's say. So we might put Python app.py. And before step would be to copy the app.py app.py file into the working directory. Before step would be to run the Python or pip install requirements.txt. Right? Before step would be to copy the requirements.txt. Remember what I said, and when we go to the Python microservice, you will see that the same steps are followed. Let's go to a Python microservice. I think ratings is a Python microservice. No, payments. Yeah, payments is a Python microservice. Let's go to its Docker file and see. See, like I told you, copy requirements.txt, pip install requirements.txt, copy app.py and execute the Python app.py. Initially, they use this as a command or as a command to run when the container is started. But later they change the uh, thing to the web server gateway interface. Like I told you, if you don't know this particular thing, you can sit with the developers. Most of the times you might not know how to start that particular uh, server or the application. You can get the entry point or CMD command from the developers. But you might have seen all the steps that I mentioned are exactly in the same order. One anti pattern in this particular Docker file is to switch to the root user. Better don't do it, but because this is a demo project, they have done it. Now let's go to another service, right? Cart, we understood how to containerize it. Let's go to catalog. In catalog, which is again a Node.js thing, you will find the same things, right? Difference between cart and catalog. Literally, there is no difference, right? If you go to the server.js, uh, sorry, if you go to the uh, Docker file of cart, there are 15 lines and the same lines and the same commands are available in the catalog Docker file also. So this should explain you if you know how to write a Docker file for a particular programming language, you almost know for other applications, wherever, whichever project that you work on, some things might change, but the overall structure will be the same. So you can use this particular project to understand containerization of Node.js, Python, Java, Go language, PHP, everything is available in this particular project. So see how useful is this. Now go to the dispatch. Dispatch is a Go language one. Like I told you uh, in Go language, we copy the Go, go mod. So here uh, the source code is copied. Everything uh, the dot go files are copied. Then they are executing the go mod just like pip install or npm install and run the go install go install is to start the application kind of right so uh, sorry go install is to build uh, the go library my bad and once the library is built they are just executing the library so the library is dispatch and here they are running the dispatch particular library that is created or the binary that is created better we call it binary so let's go to the uh, let's say shipping application. So shipping application is uh, a Java application. We can see the pom.xml here. And if you go to the Docker file, this one is slightly different here. They are using multi-stage Docker build where in the first stage they are actually building some jar and they are copying it here. If you see right, they are copying the jar from the build stage to yeah, so from the build stage, they are getting the jar file from a particular folder and they are copying it to the OPT shipping folder in the final stage. And here using the CMD command, they are executing the shipping dot jar. So what they're technically doing here to reduce the image size. Okay, initially to build the Java binary such as the jar file or the war file, 
there are too many things that is required. Like for example, we need Maven installed. We need the dependencies that are installed, which can be uh, very heavy in nature. So your container image size will become heavy. So using the multi-stage Docker build concept, in the first stage, they used a heavy image, that is the Debian image, and they have installed Maven on top of this image. They got all the dependencies and they built the shipping.jar. Instead of directly executing the shipping.jar here, they took the shipping.jar and copied it to a very lightweight image, the OpenJDK image, and that shipping.jar is executed in the runtime build image. So this is the build image and this is the runtime image. In the build image, they got all the dependencies. In the runtime image, they just copied the jar file from the build image and are executing here. So this is the concept of multi-stage Docker builds, which I have explained, I think, in TA26 of Docker Zero to Hero series, where I explained how to reduce the Go image size from 800 MB to 1 MB. You can watch that video. Perfect. So similarly, there are uh, containerization uh, Docker files that are available in each and every folder. Let us see, meanwhile, if our cluster is created. <clears throat> Perfect. So my Kubernetes cluster is now ready. If you go to resources, I can see the cluster here. So we have the Docker files available. We have the cluster available. What is the one step that is left is to understand how to create Kubernetes manifest for this Docker images. Let's say once you execute all of these things, you got some Docker images. What this project has done, they have already uh, created the Docker images and they stored the Docker images in the Docker hub for anyone to pull that. Or we can also create the Docker images, but just to save time. Creating Docker images is not a big deal. If you just uh, go to the readme file of this particular project, right? If you just do this command, docker compose build and docker compose push, you provide the parameters of your repository and your Docker registry or container registry. All the images are pushed to your container registry. This is just, it will take some additional five to 10 minutes. So instead of just pushing onto my container registry, I will use the ones that they already have, right? So assume all the container images using this Docker files, we have created all the container images. Now, if you go to k folder, so I created this EKS and AKS folders. Initially, they just have the k folder, but if you directly take this and try to deploy it on AKS, it is not working for some configuration changes, which I've done to the Helm charts. Uh, basically, with respect to persistent volumes, storage classes, readiness probes, I've tweaked something. So if you go to the KH folder, so here there is Helm chart. And inside the Helm charts, so if you are new to Helm charts, basically there are three important components of Helm chart. One is chart.yaml. Second is template dot yaml third is values dot yaml the difference between deploying your kubernetes yaml manifest directly like you can take your kubernetes yaml manifest like create a deployment dot yaml and service dot yaml for each microservice so there are eight microservices so it will be something like 16 YAML files, and then there are two DBs. So again, one deployment for DB, one service for DB, and for Redis also. So overall, it will be some 24 YAML manifests that we have to create for this particular project. You can deploy all of them like using kubectl apply command or kubectl create command. But the disadvantage is that in real time in organizations, what we do is we might have different environments such as dev, staging, prod. And for each environment, we might have some parameters that are different. Let's say for developer environment, we might start containers with resource requests and limits such as 
I will say if it is a developer environment, uh, each of my container or each of my pod uh, should be not accessing anything more than 512 uh, MB RAM, or it should not exceed uh, one CPU of usage. Whereas in production environment, I can say that, okay, my pods can actually go up to one GB and two CPU. So there can be parameters that are dynamic. So if you use the Kubernetes plain YAML manifest, the problem is you have 24 manifests. And if you have five environments, you will end up creating 24 into five, 120 YAML manifest, which will be super complicated to maintain. Instead, if you create a Helm chart using these three files inside the template dot, sorry, inside the template folder, this is not template dot YAML, my bad. So you have a templates folder. Inside the templates folder, you can actually dump all your 24 YAML manifests and whatever the parameters that you want to keep dynamic, you can just update them using values.yaml. So templates folder will have all this 24 YAML manifest and values.yaml will modify the values that are dynamic when you run helm install command. So the values.yaml will take all the values or helm will take all the values from the values.yaml and update them in the templates folder of the deployment manifest. Chart.yaml is something to understand the metadata of the chart or to know the version of the chart in future if you have multiple versions. Let's take a look at that. You will understand better. So if you go to templates folder, within the templates folder, like I told you, you can dump all the YAML manifest that you want. And if I go to one of these YAML manifest, let's say the payments deployment.yaml. Here, if you see, it is saying that this value is dynamic. Okay. And it is saying the image is dynamic. So probably they have uh, for dev environment one image for production environment one image or the repo changes for environment wise right and here it is saying the payment gateway is also dynamic which is one environment variable so payment gateway might change right some people might want uh, a particular payment gateway other people might want another payment gateway similarly uh, restart policy is dynamic tolerations is dynamic node label selector is dynamic so Whenever you want to keep anything dynamic, you can go to the templates folder. You can dump all your YAML manifest inside the templates folder and whatever fields you want to keep it dynamic in every YAML manifest, just use this Jinja templating style. And let's pick up one thing, values, image, repo, right? So what this particular Jinja templating does is it understands, oh, okay, Helm understands image, repository has to be taken from the values.yaml. There will be some field called image inside image. There will be a field called repo. Let's go and see if it is true. So if you go to values.yaml. So inside values.yaml, there has to be the image and inside image there is repo. So this is replaced. So the repo name becomes RoboShop version becomes latest. So these values are replaced inside the deployment file. For each of the YAML manifest, if instead of changing the repo name, I can simply change it here and it is reflected in all the YAML manifests. In all 24 YAML manifests, I can change the repo name in one single shot if I change it here. That's the advantage of using Helm. You can dynamic, make your uh, YAML files dynamic. Okay, so this is about the Helm chat that is created by this particular project. Cool. Now what I will do is I will go back to my cluster and let me pick up the name of my cluster. It's a three tire, right? Name of the Kubernetes cluster is three tire. So I will go to my terminal. Let me pull my terminal. What I will suggest is just go to my repository. So this is the repository, right? So go here, copy the repository URL 
and once you copy the repository url just go to your terminal and any particular folder that you want and run the command git so i did this in the i am viramalla folder i just did git clone followed by the url and you will get this three tier architecture project cloned in your repository in your local you can just do cd three tier architecture demo in my case my folder name is different i have it as robo shop in your case the folder name will be three tier architecture demo perfect now first thing that i have to do is i have to connect my terminal to this kubernetes cluster so for that i will just copy the cluster name that is three tier and run this command called aks let me copy it from here aks get credentials okay so the command is az aks you need to have the azure cli terminal on your local and then the command becomes az aks get credentials hyphen hyphen resource group what is the name of the resource group in my case the name of the resource group is e-commerce demo right i think we created it as e-commerce demo and the name of the cluster is three tier three tier so this will pull the cube configuration and store it in my local now once this is successful i will be able to talk to that kubernetes cluster i'll put this command inside the day 7 day 16 folder or day 17 folder don't worry so now what i'll do is i'll just say i'll just test if the connection is successful cube ctl get pods so i will i'm just trying to see if connection is successful perfect so i am connected to that kubernetes cluster or what you can also do is just type cube ctl config current context so this will show what is your current context in my case the current context is three tier so that explains that i am connected to the cluster this is the best way probably do this and now i will switch to aks folder and then i'll switch to helm folder i will highly recommend you to please spend some time here and go through each and every file that is in the templates folder because i cannot explain each and every file uh, you can just go through the template folder and browse through the files you will get very good knowledge and now i will just run the command called uh, you can go to the uh, documentation basically the helm install command if you go uh, to the aks folder here so if you just scroll down uh, this are the commands that we have to execute type cube ctl create namespace robot shop uh, okay i know what is the issue here in my case uh, i will fix it in a second that is with respect to my uh, actually with respect to my wifi so let me fix it. okay now it should work so the namespace is created and then the next command is to just run the robot shop right so the command is helm install what is the name of your chat followed by the namespace where you want to install so now it will install the helm chat and it will install all the deployments right so let's wait for all the pods to be created and one important thing that i have to show you is which i think is worth showing if we go to the templates folder like all the deployments are quite common but if we go to the redis stateful set so the redis stateful set actually comes up with the persistent volume claim you have to use the persistent volume claim and in the persistent volume claim right volume claim templates there are fields that are worth noting one is what is your access mode what is your storage class and what is your file mode so these are the three parameters that usually are important in the persistent volume claim 
if you have not worked with stateful applications before like i told you in our stateful sets the deployment sorry the stateful set kind that we create we have to provide the persistent volume claim and the storage class along with the drivers if required there are csi drivers along with the drivers they create the persistent volume and we will get the persistent volume so there is a pv controller and there is the csi driver depending upon what kind of persistent volume that we are picking up in our case what we are doing is we are going with the default storage class let me explain this so in aws or in azure there are different types of storage classes that you can go with what are these storage classes if you look at azure storage services we have azure files we have azure disks right so azure disk is just something like ebs and azure files is like efs on the amazon so mostly we will go with these kind of options for the persistent volumes so when you create a stateful set with a persistent volume claim asking the aks cluster that i need 1 gb of data let's say so in our case i think we are asking 1 gb yeah so are requesting for 1 gb storage now from where will aks fetch this 1 gb storage for us we have to define that in our persistent volume claim we don't have to just provide the storage value but we should also say what kind of storage are we looking for right even if it is on aws we have to tell this are we looking for ebs are we looking for efs in azure are we looking for azure disk are we looking for azure files we have to provide this information if you just say default on the aks platform then we will get azure disk like if you go to the aks cluster and just search for kubectl get storage class so here there are multiple storage classes right you can see azure file you can see this is managed disk this is the default azure disk you have a csi premium Uh, these are the premium uh, storages that are available with azure you can also request this but the default option is the managed disk and when you are going with the default option what azure will do is on your azure platform it will create a azure disk for you and it will grant the redis in our case the redis stateful set with that particular 1 gb storage now that is also happening under the hood if you do cube ctl get pods minus n robot shop you will notice that redis is created right and let's describe the redis cube ctl get pods or cube ctl describe pod redis minus n robot shop because in that namespace we created so it said created container pulled image and attached volume called this particular thing now how is that volume attached if you go to cube ctl or uh, let's do instead of describe if we just do edit and if you just search for claim so okay so just search for claim here you can see that the persistent volume claim that is attached with this redis stateful set is data redis 0 so now you can just search for cube ctl get pvc minus n robo shop this is the persistent volume claim it is asking for 1 gb and storage class is default that means you will get azure disk so if you change the storage class in pvc uh, instead of get if you just do edit of course you cannot edit it now once the pvc is created you cannot edit it 
before that you can edit but if you change the storage class name here from default to azure files then you will get that 1 gb in the azure files when should you go for azure files or when should you go for azure disk very simple if your uh, storage is accessed by a single pod then go with the ebs in aws or azure disks in the azure if your volume okay if you have some volume that is accessed by multiple containers across different nodes or across same node you have multiple like okay let's say across multiple nodes if you have different pods that are accessing a common storage let's say this storage has some config files then you should go with efs or azure files so if you have a shared storage go with efs or azure files if you have only pod one pod that is accessing or just one time read then in that particular case you can go with ebs or azure this right so if we go back now let's see kubectl get pods you can also use some uh, third party storages right it's not only about ebs efs or it's not about azure disk and uh, azure files sometimes we might also use external uh, storage servers such as netapp or we can use other things as well in such cases there is a concept called csi driver where you have to create those drivers or the netapp or any provider they have to provide those drivers roboshop i assume all the pods are running now let's see perfect all the pods are currently running and this is what we wanted now all the microservices are running and all the pods are also running now it's time where we will go to our kubernetes cluster and we have to enable the ingress configuration why because right now all the pods are running and all the services are also running but how do you access this my bad minus n robot shop so all the pods are running all the services are running how do you access this from external world right so you can access this like the web is created using a load balancer but it is preferred to go with an ingress configuration right so you can use the load balancer as well load balancer type service but the problem is that if you use a load balancer service uh, you don't get the extra capabilities that an ingress controller can offer for example with ingress controller you can configure web application firewall you can do uh, path based routing you can do host based routing you can do lot of capabilities so of course i can just uh, access it on this particular url now on the load balancer ip but what i wanted to do is i want to show you using ingress configuration for that what we need to do is just go to your uh, aks cluster and click on the networking here you have a checkbox which says enable ingress controller just select this option and click on apply it is very very simple on aks if you are doing with on aws then you have to uh, create the, uh, the deploy the helm chart for ingress controller configuration and you also have to use the csa driver for ebs in azure it comes natively all these components are you know very easy to configure on the aks cluster so click on apply this will take some 5 to 10 minutes we need to wait meanwhile let us see how to write the ingress file so there is already ingress file on the github repository in the same folder but i will quickly show you uh, just go with the api version choose the kind as ingress provide the namespace as roboshop name can be anything doesn't matter but namespace has to be uh, within the Robo roboshop so that uh, you can track your ingress resource then you have uh, rules where i did not select any rule i just mentioned that the service has to be web 
which is hosting my uh, website and the port number has to be 8080 which is the port on which the service is running if you just do get uh, svc one more time you can see that the web service is running on port 8080 that's why on my ingress file i have the service name as web and port as 8080 other than that this is all the default configuration one important thing that you have to mention is the ingress class name abhishek why should i mention the ingress class name in some cases your organization right uh, where you are using one kubernetes cluster let's say and this kubernetes cluster is shared by two teams let us take an example so this is team one which is using namespace a this is team two which is using namespace b and these people want to use nginx ingress controller and your team wants to use the azure application gateway ingress controller okay so in this case how will you differentiate which ingress file is read by which ingress controller so the azure ingress gateway if it reads the nginx ingress and nginx if it reads this one then it will be a mess so that's why what we will do is whenever we create an ingress we can configure that with ingress class name and this ingress class name is the something that your ingress controller will look for by default azure application gateway ingress controller will watch for ingress resources with this particular ingress class name if you remove this one it will not be able to identify right if you want to identify everything on your kubernetes cluster then you can go to your azure application gateway ingress controller and remove the ingress class name from there also otherwise it is better to keep it and any ingress resources that you are creating for your azure application gateway better you provide this ingress class name within the spec so let us apply this configuration kubectl apply minus f ingress.yaml minus n robo shop cool now i will just wait for my ingress controller to be started just refresh here it says it will take some 10 to 15 minutes but it might not take 15 minutes most of the times uh, we can see it running in five minutes also cool it is running we can verify uh, by just searching kubectl get ingress sorry kubectl get pods minus a so i am searching for pods in the cluster all across the cluster and i'll just grep with this particular name actually i know that is uh, that it is in the cube system namespace but just to show you that the ingress app gateway uh, what is missing let me are the pods still not created let's see maybe they are still creating let me search enable ingress controller ingress app gateway kubectl get pods minus n cube system let me try here uh yeah they are actually created okay they are just created with ingress hyphen app gw i'm searching for app gateway so that's why uh i was not able to find it but anyways i just wanted to show you that the ingress pods are up and running now if you go to this kubectl edit deploy minus n cube system you can also look at your uh, my bad so this is the deployment name right so you can also read through your uh, ingress controller configuration with which configuration it is created right so it is created with how many number of replicas what is the affinity rule uh, you can search for all of those things right so here there are some labels that are attached automatically 
which says uh, this is managed by AKS, so the ingress controller. You can uh, get to see all of those fields. I would recommend just going through the uh, ingress controller deployment YAML file also, so that you will understand what are the different parameters that are available in the ingress controller, right? Otherwise, uh, if you are new, you can ignore it for now. Yeah, so my ingress controller is also running. Now I will expect kubectl get ing, which is shorthand for ingress, minus n uh, cube system. Sorry, minus n uh, RoboShop. Okay, so the address is not yet available. So the class is defined, post is defined, but the address is not yet uh, available, which is strange. Let us see what is happening. So we will, we can wait for 30 seconds, but ideally we should see the address by now. Azure application gateway, class name is looking right. kubectl get, let's look at the logs of the ingress controller so that we will understand that. So I did kubectl describe or I did the edit deployment, right? So I can use the logs. So I'm, I'm just looking at the log of the uh, ingress controller to just see uh, what is wrong. Did I miss something? Okay, it said failed to list v1 beta1 application gateway rewrite. So there is some issue here, which is causing the ingress controller to fail. Okay, let's try to debug through the error. Fail to list v1 beta1 application gateway rewrite. This is not at all related to our resource for sure. Okay, we definitely have nothing to do with this particular error message. So let me try one thing. So I can actually report this error to the uh, AKS and uh, Maybe I can also report this to the Azure application gateway ingress controller. If this, I mean, this does not look an issue from our side. That's why. But meanwhile, what I'll just try to do is kubectl get pods minus n uh, cube system. And uh, let me just delete it and try one more time. Maybe if there is any intermittent issue with uh, the AKS ingress controller, let's see. So I've just deleted the pod. I did not do any additional troubleshooting. I'm just hoping it's an intermittent issue. Otherwise we need to uh, really look into the AKS blocks or something to understand what went wrong. Is the new controller created? Yeah, so a new controller is created. Let's go through its logs. kubectl logs pod minus n uh, kubectl logs minus n cube system. Let's see. Okay. Till now, there is no error. Listing and watching, that is fine. It's not an error here. It's just listing. Oh, okay. It again failed to list something. There is a clear error message. Fail to list application rewrite. Azure application gateway rewrites dot app gateway. I did not create anything with respect to rewrite. So I'm quite surprised. Okay, but this time the address is created. Very strange. I think there should be some issue with the uh, ingress controller or it is taking too long time. But I re, uh, sorry, I deleted the pod and I restarted. 
I got the address, something that I'll definitely report. But right now, let me just enter this and my Stans Robo Shop is up and running. So this is how you get your uh, three tier architecture up and running. Uh, go through the GitHub repository thoroughly. There are uh, too many configurations and within the Helm folder, there are deployment files, service files, ingress file that I've just shown you. And also the stateful set configuration, which is very important. So I hope you found this video informative. Thank you so much for watching. See you all in the next one. Take care everyone. Bye-bye.